welcome to this um, edition of the Perspective in Inflammation podcast, a series brought to you by the CSF, which shines a spotlight onto experts in the field of inflammation. My name is uh, Professor Anka Katrina from the Karolinska, and uh, with me uh, is my fellow CSF steering committee member, Professor Johannes Bilsma from the University Medical Center Utrecht. Uh, we will um, be discussing how immunological knowledge of inflammatory disease has evolved shortly. But first, I would really like to, to understand a little bit more about you, Professor Bisma. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what attracted you to the field of rheumatology? Well, uh, probably different items. I think that um, being able to take care of patients for a prolonged period of time was an important thing that I liked in the field of internal medicine. And uh, being in the field of internal medicine, I thought, well, if you really want to go into more depth and do research, then uh, it's better to focus on one area. And I was very much interested in the immune system and all the new things which were happening in the immune system. And then the specialty aiming most to that field of immunology was rheumatology. And I became a rheumatologist and I never regretted that step. Okay. Because it has been a great time and especially the last uh, 20 years have been a golden decade for rheumatology, especially for our patients who in the past, when I started being a rheumatologist, my uh, waiting room was full of wheelchairs and nowadays I don't see any wheelchair anymore. So the progress in our field has been enormous and that has been a pleasure and an honor to be part of it. Have you ever imagined at the beginning that it's going to end up like this? In a no, it was not uh, to be imagined at that time, no. Okay. And uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about your center, which is based in Utrecht? Yeah, in Utrecht we have a very nice uh, uh, academic hospital and we also have a very nice uh, and a big children's hospital together with it. And we have been working for many years together with our pediatric friends in the field of rheumatic diseases. So that was a stimulus. And we also have a very strong immunology department at Utrecht and that was very helpful in doing things together. So we were able not only to do clinical studies, but also do a lot of basic research. And in addition to that, we had the possibility to work with, together with our friends in the field of orthopedic surgery, because we also had quite some interest in osteoarthritis and modalities to influence osteoarthritis. So um, a type of translational profile of, of, of the, yes, the type indeed. of research and, and the center. Yes, and that's really stimulating to do, yeah. And, um, your research spans numerous therapy areas within inflammation. Could you maybe highlight some of your key interests for us? Yes, I, I think I've been busy in three areas. One area is the glucocorticoids. We've been doing a lot of research in clinical uh, effects of glucocorticoids, but also in side effects. We have done clinical studies with glucocorticoids, so that's an important item we are looking at. Further, I have been active in the field of strategies, changing strategies in the treatment of patients with early rheumatoid arthritis. And the third one is the field of osteoarthritis, where I've been interested in phenotyping osteoarthritis because I think that osteoarthritis is not one disease, it's a final common pathway. And if you really want to make progress in that area, we need to do phenotyping, find out more about it. So in these three areas, we have been active and uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to see how things have developed. You are always mentioning this uh, interplay between immunology and rheumatology. It was what attracted you yeah. from the beginning. So I was thinking that it would be interesting uh, to, to maybe update on the major breakthroughs in immunological knowledge that actually led to the development of disease-modifying anti rheumatic drug or to the way we are yes. using the, these yeah. drugs today. Uh, it's very interesting. When I started as a rheumatologist, we had the glucocorticoids, which were, of course, very specific. I think glucocorticoids influence every cell in our body. And every measurement we do is influenced by glucocorticoids, so that was very broad. We had some specific treatment, which were completely empirical, gold for instance. But then there came a time that the knowledge how important the immune system was for the development of rheumatoid arthritis, that drugs like methotrexate came into the possibility to use. And then we have been able to do some studies finding out the clinical relevance of that. After that, the role of cytokines became more and more important. So the possibilities to influence specific uh, cytokines came the further next step in the development of our treatment modalities. And then we have made a big progress there, but then additional progress has been made by our knowledge about the signal transduction and the possibilities to interfere there, leading to the 
pleasant ta targeted synthetic uh, DMARDs. So you can see that there's a very nice um, in between between the development of what we know about the immune system and rheumatoid arthritis and the possibilities we have to interfere. And if you're coming from very aspecific glucocorticoids to very specific targeted synthetic DMARDs, it's really showing the knowledge that has been increased by fundamental research. So translation research is the way to go forward. Absolutely, that's it. And um, also thinking now, how could this be taken further in terms that we, we started with a mechanism and then mm -hmm. we developed uh, these more specific therapies. How should we use these specific therapies in a better way in our patients? So going back a little bit to the mechanism, is that something that it's possible or feasible in the future? It must be possible because we still have an unmet need for patients that we cannot treat adequately. But, if, uh, but also we have to think about uh, two ways of development. One way is the strategies and the other way is the specific treatment we are using. And I think we have learned a lot about strategies to treat to target, for instance. But um, that if you do that in the right way, you get a lot of improvement, perhaps more than having an additional cytokine inhibitor. And also, it is very important, the concept of having an early diagnosis and start the treatment straight away. So, we have made a comparison between studies we did, this uh, tight control methotrexate plus or minus glucocorticoids versus tight control methotrexate with tocilizumab or without uh, tocilizumab. And then you can see that if you give this treatment very early on, not in the first weeks, but after half a year, the outcome is quite the same. So it is very much related to the strategy you are using, perhaps more than the drugs. But that's especially in the patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. I think that especially for the established pa rheumatoid arthritis patients, we have to realize that it's a lifelong disease. The mean duration of the disease is 30 years or longer. And it's quite something if you're stable for two or three years on one kind of medication. But after that period of time, quite often there's less response and you need other medications. So there will be a continuous need to get further into the pathophysiology, to get further knowledge about our immune system, to add new drugs or new modalities to treat our patients. But if you will have to describe the principles then of uh, treat to target, what mm -hmm. are the most important things that one should rem remember when we are talking about treat to target? Uh, uh, yes, I think it's not only the principle. So I think nearly all the rheumatologists know the principle very well and they try to adhere to it, but sometimes it's difficult because of the busy daily clinical practice. But there has been a very nice study from, uh, from Scandinavia called the FINRACO, in which they applied the tight control uh, system. But then they later on checked, they had a study duration of two years and there were 24 visits in that study for tight control. And then later on they checked how often people deviated from having all those uh, uh, visits and whether or not they measured the right things and whether they adopted treatment at the right moment. So they, they scored us, so to say, they were a uh, doctor was following three to target actively or not actively. And they showed a very significant difference in those who did it actively. So we have to realize it's quite difficult to do, but it's really again to, uh, to get there. So not only saying on paper I will do it, but also doing it actively every time and being very secure on that. And that it's feasible and it's done now in clinical practice? Well, I have, it's for me easy to say, I'm coming from the Netherlands and <laughs> we have the possibility to do a lot of these things. And I realize that a lot of our friends in Romania or in Ecuador or other places in the world don't have those opportunities. But um, I think it's worthwhile. So if you, uh, have a certain amount of money. I think it's more worthwhile to put it on the surface to be sure that the patient can be seen in time, to be sure that the patient can be followed up in time, than adding much more money for new drugs. But that uh, depends on the area where you're living. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, that takes uh, us to uh, maybe to the future and looking forward. And uh, we are wondering what are the key upcoming developments that. Uh, our listeners should be aware of in, in this field that you have touched upon today? Well, I, I try to make a bit of a link between your research and what we are doing. So 
I think there is indeed for the research a very important reason to continue finding out how can we make a very early diagnosis, how can we understand the first phases of the disease before the patient gets complaints, because that's the way forward for new developments of our drugs. But if you look at the daily clinical practice, I think for the um, practicing uh, clinician, it's more important now to make an early diagnosis and start treatment straight away. And I think if we are able to get more people doing this, then we really make steps forward. And that's also the reason why from the EULA side, we started a campaign, Don't Delay, Connect Today, trying to raise public awareness for an early diagnosis, but not only for an early diagnosis that the patient comes to the doctor, but also that the GPs know very well about rheumatic diseases so that they're able to recognize what's going on. And thereafter, if they send them to the rheumatologist, that the service is available and easily accessible. Thank you for your time, Professor Bilma. We hope that our listeners have enjoyed our discussion today and gained some insight into how our knowledge of pathogenesis in inflammation has evolved over time. Please don't forget to subscribe to the CSF on your favorite podcast app and visit the CSF site for free to access educational material, including summary slides, author interviews, and a monthly podcast hosted by the CSF chairman, Professor Jan McInnes. Thank <laughs> you.